Great Sioux War started with the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. The treaty established peace between the U.S. and the Sioux Nation and other tribes of the Northern Plains. The Sioux received a large reservation which comprised what is now most of western South Dakota. The other lands were reserved as hunting and fishing territory for all the Plains tribes. All the land was closed to whites except for official government personnel. The treaty guaranteed the tribes sole access to the Powder River Territory and the Black Hills. By 1870, it became increasingly difficult for the U.S. Army to keep settlers and miners out of the territory. In the meantime, Lakota and Cheyenne began pressuring the Arikara, Crow, and Shawnee out of the Powder River area. The Black Hills also became an area of contention. Lumber interests were desiring to gain access to the forest and the Black Hills, and rumors of gold encouraged miners to venture into the area. In response to these commercial interests, the U.S. government in 1874 sent Lieutenant Colonel George Custer on an expedition into the Black Hills. The expedition confirmed that there was gold in them Thar Hills. The following year, the U.S. offered to purchase the Black Hills, which the Sioux refused to do. In response to the rebuff of the government's offer, President Grant's administration refused to evict trespassers in the Black Hills and ordered all indigenous bands to return to the reservations by the end of January 1876. The non-reservation bands ignored the order, even if they wished to comply. Travel in the Northern Plains during the winter was extremely difficult. General Philip Sheridan commander of the U.S. Army in the West, on February the 8th, ordered General Alfred Terry and George Crook to begin a winter campaign against the bands outside the reservation. The campaign, ordered by General Sheridan, was a three-pronged advance into the Powder River country. Sheridan, however, gave only general orders and the two generals in the field were told only to cooperate. No one was placed in central command. Colonel Gibbon was to advance east from Fort Ellis in Montana. General Terry was to advance west from Fort Abraham Lincoln. With Terry was the 7th Cavalry under the command of Lieutenant Colonel George Custer. The third column under the command of General Crook, was to advance north from Fort Fetterman. Gibbon and Terry delayed their departure because of severe winter weather. Crook, in spite of severe cold, marched from Fort Fetterman on one march. His target was the camps of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, believed to be on the area of the Tongue or Powder River. Crook's column had about 880 men, cavalry, infantry, civilian packers, scouts, and newspaper reporters. The march, which followed the old Bozeman Trail, was slow because of severe cold, two Indian raids, and a blizzard. At the site of the old Fort Reno, Cook established a forward supply base, leaving his wagons and infantry. With the cavalry, Cook kept moving north. On the 16th, Cook's scouts reported seeing warriors shadowing the troopers. With this information, Cook divided his command. He sent Colonel Joseph Reynolds with 380 troopers to follow the warriors' trail while he and 300 troopers and the pack train 
followed. Early on March 17th, the Army scouts reported to Reynolds that they had found a village of about a hundred lodges on the Powder River. Reynolds planned a multi-prong attack. Two companies under Captain Knowles was to attack the south end of the camp. One of the companies under Captain Egan was to attack the village itself and Knowles would take the other company and cut off the pony herd. Captain Mills was to take two companies and attack the camp from the west. The two remaining companies were to occupy the hills to the north and west of the village to prevent the Indians from escaping. Because of poor intelligence and the rough terrain, the separate companies were unable to coordinate their attacks. While both the village and the pony herd were captured, the Cheyenne were able to escape into the hills north and west of the village, where they fired into the troopers and horses, killing and wounding several. The village was a band of northern Cheyenne, not the Lakota camp of Crazy Horse that the army thought. While some of the troopers maintain a firefight, with the Cheyenne warriors in the hills, others set about destroying the village and its contents. Many of the soldiers took buffalo robes to protect them from the cold. Satisfied with the destruction of the village, Reynolds ordered a withdrawal. In his haste, Reynolds left the bodies of three soldiers and one badly wounded trooper. Twelve hours later, at 9 p.m., Reynolds halted his command. During the withdrawal, the Cheyenne recaptured most of their pony herd. The next day, Crook and Reynolds united and returned to Fort Fetterman. The Battle of the Powder River had cost the army four men killed, six wounded, and about a 66 suffering frostbite. Cheyenne lost three killed, three wounded, and several deaths from exposure. They also lost their teepees, much of the ammunition, and most of their food and clothing. Although the attack destroyed a large amount of Indian property, it was poorly carried out and probably solidified the Indians' resistance to the government's attempt to force them to sell the Black Hills and live on a reservation. Upon returning to Fort Fetterman, Crook ordered Reynolds court-martialed on three charges. Ereliction of duty in failing to properly support the attacking columns. For destroying Indian supplies instead of keeping them for the army. And losing the captured Indian ponies. On January 1877, Reynolds was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to suspension from rank and command for one year. President Grant, Reynolds' friend and West Point classmate, remitted the sentence. However, Reynolds never served in the military again and retired on a disability in June of that year. Today, the battlefield is on private land but still visible along State Highway 391. Unfortunately, it was very late in the day when I was in the area, so I was unable to visit the site. In 1934, a monument to the soldiers who fought in the battle was placed on the site. The monument is an embedded with the headstones for the four soldiers whose bodies were left on the field. A monument to the Cheyenne who fought in the battle is across the road from the soldier's monument. It is a sandstone boulder with the flag of the Northern Cheyenne tribe painted on it. Unfortunately, according to my research, this monument is not well maintained. Thank you so very much for watching this video. I greatly appreciate it. If you like this videos and others like it, please 
hit the like button, subscribe if you have not already, and leave a comment.